I'm Lori Harrison. My husband, Boyd, is sitting beside me, and he is a proud participant, uh, or not participant. <laughs> He's a proud patient of uh, Dr. Domes. He uh, received one of his implants. I think all, I think Dr. Channon was got the the duty that day because uh, he was off with uh, COVID, I think, I believe. Yep. yep. Uh, and uh, James Fro in the beautiful green room there, he's the one that's going to be helping me work through this. So Lord help us. I'm really technically challenged. So I do apologize to everyone. So uh, uh, as I mentioned, I, we do have uh, other board members that are joining us here tonight. And that's with the Regina board. Um, we have Larry, who's got his headphones on. And who else do we have here? I did have Lawrence on here, and we have Peter, who's joining us, Peter uh, Brown, and he's uh, joining us from uh, Arizona, and I think he's still there. Uh, so anyhow, um, we are on Treaty for Land, and I wanted to acknowledge that uh, with sincere uh, hearts and the greatest respect. Uh, uh, we are on the uh, Treaty 4 territory, home of the Indigenous and Métis people. Um, now, group guidelines, Zoom instructions, the chat and all your buttons down at the bottom, you have the chat function. And if you want to put up your, your hand or um, ask questions, you go over to the reactions buttons. Um, if that's at the bottom of your screen, the presentation is being recorded. Uh, if you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your video button. And that's down at the bottom of the screen. So it should be on the left hand side of your screen. At this point in time, I'm going to ask everyone to please mute their mics until we're ready to ask questions. If you do not watch your face uh, um, recorded, please touch the stop video on your part and it'll turn your screen black. <clears throat> uh, recording will be stopped before we have our, our group discussion and our round table. And that's where we can share personal experiences and as such. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. Um, Days with the, okay, when we uh, share our group discussion, what we uh, talk about in, in our group discussion stays yeah. with our group. We, re against we recognize the fact that some people may not feel comfortable talking in a larger group. So that's fine. You know, you don't have to discuss anything. But, you know, if you do, you can. And if you have a question, just pop onto the bottom of the screen and ask it via chat if you so wish. And then we can bring those questions up. And I believe Dr. Chen and Dr. Uh, Domes had asked that we do that at the end of their presentations. Due, due to time restraints, we ask all participants to be mindful of each other during Q&A and discussion. And so we, we can allow, allow others uh, the opportunity to share and support each other. Due to insurance guidelines, we do not provide, solicit or promote uh, and encourage participants to discuss any uh, concerns or your personal health care concerns with your doctor. And if so wish, you know, maybe Dr. Chan and Dr. Jones can recommend someone else that they have that, you know, they can recommend that you can uh, discuss things with as well in a personal matter. Please be aware that our, our healthcare professionals are limited to answering any of your personal questions. Now that means they don't know lick from sin what your personal health information is. Uh, and each person is an individual. You have your own story and uh, different healthcare needs should be treated as, as individual as you are that are joining us. Now, tonight, we're getting down to the nitty gritties here. We have two fantastic docs joining us, and I so I say so so thankful that you've been able to, to join us, Dr. Tristan Domes. And Dr. Domes was born and raised in Saskatoon and completed his Bachelor's of Science degree at the University of Saskatchewan 
a medical degree at the University of Alberta and urology residency at Western University. After res residency, Tristan completed a male reproductive medicine and surgery fellowship at the University of Toronto and has been working in Saskatoon since 2011. Tristan is an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Saskatchewan and is heavily involved in the administration and delivery of undergraduate, postgraduate, continuing and continuing medical education. After completing his master's of education degree in 2014, he became a director of undergraduate. Now, if I, I may say this wrong, Dr. Domes, please correct me. Undergraduate of Surgical Education in the University of Saskatchewan 2015 to 2022. And it says the Director of, of Admissions, is that correct? Yeah, so I was the Director of Admissions from 2019 to present. Exactly. And I was director of Surgical Education up until just last June, yeah. Excellent, thank you. I, I wanna make sure I said that correct. Now you sit in numerous college uh, of medicine, Royal College and Canadian Urological Association committees with over 300, or pardon me, 300, well, that was pretty good. Over 35 published papers, including and leading the most recent Canadian urological guidelines, erectile dysfunction and three book chapters, his current academic and research interests involve quality improvement, incentives, and developing and evaluating strategies to improve the delivery of medical education. Whew, that was a tough one, Dr. Dorms. <laughs> but now, Dr. Garrison Chan is our other presenter tonight. Now, I, I love your, your, your bio here, Dr. Chan. Uh, he completed his medical school at the University of Saskatchewan as urological surgical surgery training at Western University. He then spent two years of additional clinical training with an, oh, hang on, I've got to get the glasses to focus, with an immers, immers, immersive fellowship. Now, did I say that correctly, Dr. Chen? Immersive? Thank you. Uh, fellowship in neurology, reconstruction, and functional urology in Melbourne, Australia. He was here that he ex he experienced for the first time winter without snow. Oh, <laughs> however, he still has not become accustomed to the local delicacy of Vegemite. And I don't bl blame you. We had a young lady live with us with, and she brought her bottle of Vegemite, believe it or not. Uh, he is an assistant professor at the university. Uh, uh, in the Department of Surgery and with cross appointment in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecological, and oh, hang on, I get the glasses. At the University of Saskatchewan, Dr. Chan has presented at numerous international meetings, co authored over 30 peer reviewed articles and abstracts, and serves as a reviewer for several urological journals. Dr. Chan strives for excellence in gerund. Oh, wait, wait, gen gen Hang on, got to cut the glasses. Genitorial or genit <laughs> okay, genital urinary reconstruction, and has performed the first sacral neuromodulation for lower urinary tract dysfunction in Saskatchewan. His other clinical interests also include stricture disease, erectile dysfunction. Okay, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. He is happy to return home to Saskatchewan where he has four full elevate brief seasons. I'll count on sessions, but it's seasons. Oh my God, that was tough. All right. Uh, anyhow, uh, Dr. Chan is going to be our first presenter up to bat. And uh, it's off to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Laurie, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And I think uh, what, we're, what we'll do is we'll do both the presentations. And then we'll, at the end, we'll leave time for questions if there are any. Oh. So oh, let me know if that's the uh, correct screen again, or do I have to swap my slides? You just have to swap it. Okay. Okay, so I have uh, no disclosures and my presentation is on the treatments for urinary leakage after prostate cancer. 
And um, so I, I just want to say thank you for everyone for your time today. Um, both Dr. Domes and I have a specific interest in cancer survivorship. And um, that's what we call it as part of this journey is cancer survivorship, not only to cure the disease, but to maintain a quality of life and view this as part of the cancer journey. And no one likes to talk about these, uh, these complications or um, uh, this sometimes difficult topic to talk about. And nobody likes to see this happen, but of course it does. And we have to move on and, and deal with it. Um, so the objectives of my talk today is to talk a little bit about the impact of incontinence, what a typical workup for a general patient with incontinence is after prostate cancer treatment, and some general treatment options and decision-making. And as Laurie was saying in the beginning, this is a generalized um, information and, and each person is specific, so it uh, may not apply in, in a specific setting to yourself. Uh, I like this quote. This is a urologist, a very old urologist, who said this about prostate cancer. And it can apply to a lot of the treatments we have for quality of life. So Dr. Whitmore said, is cure possible for those for whom it is necessary? And is cure necessary for the, those in whom it is possible? And so this can apply to a number of things, but it, and certainly in terms of the quality of life, there are a lot of things that you'll see that we can do, but does that mean we have to do it? It's it's a a long discussion that sometimes I have with a lot of patients um, and over multiple visits about what may or may not be suitable for them. And everyone is, uh, is different, so we try to make an individualized plan. We know that for prostate cancer, it's becoming more and more an issue as Canadians live longer. And as they live longer, we may see more complications with time. Obviously, with surgery, we see the issues immediately after and delayed with radiation because of just the timing of it. And I think Dr. Domes is going to speak a little bit more about uh, outcomes <laughs> related to both. The good news is that we, we shouldn't lose sight that men with prostate cancer have very, very high success rates with treatment. Most men that are screened and treated have long, fulfilling lives after. And our treatments and techniques are improving. And so the solutions that we have are because of the um, success we have with the prostate cancer treatments. Now that we know that men have great success with treatment, our focus uh, is not only to weigh on uh, eradicating the cancer, but the changes that occur afterwards, what we alluded to before called cancer survivorship. And often a lot of emphasis is placed on the treatment it sometimes feels that once we're finished with the treatment, um, we may have reached the goal, but success isn't over until we've treated you and also maybe given you back some of your life. Immediately after you become diagnosed with prostate cancer, you start on this road of survivorship. And so I think it's appropriate to um, discuss this in this setting uh, with Dr. Domes as well. Um, a little bit of the impact um, that we're going to both talk about. So some of the changes that happen after you have any type of treatment, whether it's surgical or radiation, you have weak muscles uh, that get affected by surgery, the recovery, nutrition changes that happen afterwards or radiation. The sphincter is affected because it's right by the prostate. Uh, sometimes you might have scarring or blockage. And uh, Dr. Jones will talk about the erectile dysfunction aspects. And so why does this commonly happen after treatment? So as you can see here, this is the prostate and this arrow is pointing to that sphincter muscle. And you can see it's right on the prostate. Um, that muscle, the sphincter muscle is so close that during surgery or radiation, any treatment can cause injury to that area or um, stun that area afterwards. Uh, similarly, this is an MRI scan, and you can see very close by the under, um, underlined uh, yellow area. So the levator ani is a muscle that's close to the prostate, those pelvic floor muscles, and the NVB stands for the neurovascular bundles, and those are also directly right on the prostate. So it's very common to have erectile dysfunction afterwards. And due to perhaps some awareness issues, um, incontinence is actually fairly common, but it's underreported as a lot of men don't seek attention. 
Um, and probably at least 30 to 50% of some patients have a degree of leakage after any type of prostate cancer treatment. And when we kind of uh, consider the impact of cancer survivorship, we have to consider the family unit and partners uh, specifically. And many studies have found that these men um, don't share these prostate-related health issues entirely with their partners or some men choose treatments uh, without their spousal consideration, which is typical of men. And there's also a stigma of seeking treatment. Uh, additionally, there's financial toxicity associated with travel to see a provider, supplies, time off work. All of this affects your overall recovery and quality of life. Um, in general, how we choose what type of treatments that we uh, may consider is overall general health of the patient, whether or not they've had radiation or surgery, the type of uh, leakage that they have, are they using one pads or are they using 20 pads a day? Do they have any blockage? And how bothered are they or their family members by it? because we have to take this all as a, a holistic view in terms of their overall quality of life and what their goal is to get them drier or better um, to make them uh, feel better about themselves. So for myself, when I see a patient, um, in addition to taking a history and physical, the most important things I ask about is how much they're leaking. And it's, it's not clear when we're asking number of pads because different pads are um, not the same. Uh, some people change pad more often than other people. So some people that may use two pads might be soaking through those two pads, but some people may be using two pads and only changing it just because they're going to the bathroom every time. And so the best way to measure how much they're actually leaking is to measure the actual wet weight. So the way I tell my patients is if you're using about three pads on average a day, you want to weigh your dry pads beforehand with a, a small um, a measuring device, like a small kitchen scale weight. And then at the end, collect the same amount with it totally wet and then subtract the dry weight to get the actual wet weight that you're leaking in a day. And we would say very severe leakage is over 400, sorry, 500 grams in 24 hours. The other thing that I would do is to bring them in to do a procedure called a cystoscopy. And if you've had a catheter before, this is very similar. We would go up just to examine that urine channel to make sure there's no blockage, make sure we can check the sphincter tone, the sphincter muscles to see how much of control they have. And that also helps make a little bit more of a decision about what types of treatment they are. And then when I do that, I fill up their bladder, I get them the cough or strain to see exactly how much of a flow or, stra or stream they have when they're leaking. And when we're considering treatment options, these are some of the things that we can do to make any treatment or surgery better. Basically, it's all things that our mother told us. Eat healthy, lose weight, stop smoking, maximize whatever medical issues or conditions you have. And if you have a catheter or penile clamp, we try to avoid that before surgery, just so you don't get any skin breakdown or excoriation or risk of infection. So the different types and categories of treatments, I try to divide down into either external devices or internal devices. External devices, some of you may be very familiar with, are those things that just collect urine. So some type of pads or catheters, condom drainage devices you see on the top there. There are some clamps, penile clamps and different ones that you can try that can help if you have severe leakage or any combination of the above. And of course, this is more of a uh, temporary rather than a permanent solution. Internal devices are, there's generally three categories, urethral inserts, slings, or internal taps, like an artificial sphincter. And these are more invasive, but also probably a little bit more successful. This is a newer type of device that's recently become available in Canada and Health Canada approved. It's called the, it's marketed by one company only called the Contino, and it's a urethral insert. And what it is, it's a kind of partially reusable silicone, minimally invasive procedure where once you're measured to the correct size, you insert it gently into partway into the urethra. It kind of stops there and it blocks the urine flow. So it's kind of like an, almost like an, a plug for the urethra. Um, 
it is a subscription service. So you have to pay for it kind of like with catheters or uh, other medical devices. And it's about, I think last time I checked about $100 every couple months. The good news is if you have any of these private insurance, it's covered um, by these uh, companies. Um, this uh, next treatment is a urethral sling. And what it does is it adds a little bit of pressure to reposition and support the urethra. It uses this mesh device. So you may have heard in women, they can get these slings to help lift up and reposition the urethra. It's the same idea we do it in men to add some extra support. The success rate with these is it's, it's moderate. It's not 100%. So probably I would say 60 to 70 percent on average and it's best for those with very mild leakage i have put in some of these slings for those with very severe leakage but it won't make them they have to expect that they won't be totally dry and most importantly is uh, useful in those that have pretty good muscles and sphincter control already because it augments what you already have so people that have radiation it's probably not the best um, option for them. And I would quote that their success rate is much lower, maybe 30 to 40%, mainly because after radiation, every year, the tissue gets a little bit worse and weaker. And there's not that much stability of the sling to catch on to in that area. So initially, they may get some response, but over time, that sling kind of loosens, and then they're back to where they were before. Uh, the side effects of having this procedure, it's usually generally well tolerated, it starts working immediately, but as with any surgery, and especially because the sling is causing some compression, some people may get some numbness. Uh, chronic pain after the procedure is rare, but can happen. And the worst thing that can happen is, is we put the sling in and it's too tight and you can't pee, and we have to either go back and cut it or release it. The gold standard that um, some people may have heard of is this artificial urinary sphincter device. And what it works as, as an internal clamp. So contrary to those external clamps, this is a, a device that you don't see, no one knows that you have it there. And once we implant it, it usually works very well. The main consideration is once it's in, you have to be able to work it and pump it. So you can see it's there's about three different parts in this picture there. There's the cuff, which is that internal clamp that goes around the urethra, the P-channel to close it. There's the balloon. So that's the fluid that carries the, um, the water pressure that's uh, usually in the pump. And the pump itself is what you um, actually feel and pump when you wanna go pee. So when patients have this device, they'll still get the same sensation. Their bladder will still fill up and feel like normal. The only difference is in order to pee, they can't just go and try to pee like normal. They have to push that pump to open and release that clamp valve. And then the fluid will flush all the way from the pump into the balloon. And then that clamp will be open for a set amount of time, maybe one to two minutes, allow you to pee. And then by itself, they'll slowly close over time under pressure to close that valve again. So if you haven't finished in time, you keep pumping that pump until you're completely empty. Some possible issues with it, it is an artificial device. So it's nothing's good as uh, God made it. Uh, so this device, eventually some people might have to have it replaced in five or 10 years, either due to some mechanical failure or if there's an infection, um, especially because it is a clamp, uh, over time, some people might have some ongoing leakage because it's not perfectly fit to their urethra or because it's constantly causing some pressure, some of that tissue might get a little bit weaker and the, the actual fit of the clamp might not be that great. I do have to tell patients when they have this to get some kind of medical card or alert bracelet so that if they are traveling and they're not in their normal city or province, then someone is aware that they have this device in case they need to have some type of procedure where someone needs to put in a catheter. Because if you go in and someone tries to put in a catheter and you have this device and it's on, they can't get in there because that clamp is closing the urethra. Um, some of the newer innovations, there's some newer devices that are coming um, available on market. Some of them have different types of smart balloons that actually respond to you when you're more uh, pressure situations like activities, sports, things like that, that 
can adjust the pressure setting so that you're not leaking as much. And they're, all devices now have some type of antibiotic, antibiotic coating to prevent infections. So in general, um, different types of options are external devices and internal devices. Overall, the success rates are generally high for patients that we select to have each of these treatments. And we define success as less than about a pad a day or 90% improvement in their leakage. The important thing to know is none of these are perfect fix. So your incontinence or leakage may worsen with time. And so I think the important thing is to define what quality of life means. If you're going to talk to your um, urologist or uh, family physician in terms of cancer survivorship, what, uh, what does this mean to you? And so I think this is the, the key is not to um, blindly ask for a solution, but to know what options are available to try to fit what is important to you. People often ask me what I would do, but that's different because what I would do and my goals are not the same as your goals or philosophy of life might differ. Um, and so I think if you want uh, to pursue your quality of life and pursue your best years, then uh, we have to be understanding of the options of the risk uh, reward ratio. Obviously, if something is more successful, there may be more risk associated with it. Uh, but if you want to live as long as possible um, and, and that's your goal, then maybe surgery options may not be ideal for you. But if you want to be as dry as possible, then some of those other things you might want to pursue. Um, in conclusion, cancer outcomes we know will continue to improve. We're going to continue to talk about cancer survivorship. And as more men age, more of these urinary symptoms and erectile difficulties will likely occur. There's not an easy solution, but there are a lot of solutions available. And I think if you take one thing away from this talk is that there's a lot of solutions. Um, talk with your healthcare provider about what it means to optimize your quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan. Uh, and now uh, we have Dr. Trustin Domes, who's going to give it the second half of our presentation in regards to erectile dysfunction. All right. And yes, we can see it quite nicely, Dr. Jones. Oh, excellent. excellent. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks, Dr. Chan, for that very informative talk. And I think this one nicely marries some of the same themes. Of course, this is about survivorship. This is about the journey. Um, it doesn't just end when you have your prostate cancer treatment. It continues throughout the rest of your life. And it doesn't just impact you but also your, your partner, right? So these are very important uh, aspects as we're going through treatment and the journey with you together. Um, as Lori said, and thanks again uh, for this opportunity to present to you guys. And I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the sexual dysfunction part of the talk. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that here in Saskatoon, we're on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. And certainly in partnership with our indigenous peoples, uh, we want to build uh, truth and reconciliation with uh, one another. So as Dr. Chan, and I think this is really important um, that neither of us have any conflict of interest, right? So we're, we're, we're giving you these talks basically based on best evidence, best practice without any interference or financial gain. Um, the only conflict I have, you know, not a really a conflict, but just a acknowledgement that, that I was the chair of the Canadian Urological Association ED guideline committee um, and uh, that guideline is, is now published. So male sexual function is a broad term, right? Um, we, we talk about sexual desire, erectile function, ejaculatory function, and orgasm. Each one of these is an important thing, and we could actually spend a whole hour on each one, right? Um, but, you know, when we look at prostate cancer treatments, really every single one of these is impacted, okay, to a different degree. But absolutely every single one, no matter what type of treatment you get, whether that's just hormonal therapy, surgical management, radiation therapy. And this is because, of course, erections, in terms of erections, require intact nerves. 
And when we're doing surgery, you see this is a sort of a representation of how rich the nervous plexus is around the prostate. The prostate's marked in P there and, and around the urethra there. And really, there's no other way to get the prostate out than to disrupt these nerves in some way. Even those who say, oh, I do a perfect nerve sparing. No, you have to, in order to, to get to the area of dissection, you have to at least disturb these nerves in some way. So erections require nerves. So just by virtue, especially whether it's, it's surgery or even radiation, it requires um, some dissection or disruption of these nerves. Like I said, it's, it's surgery is very quick. Radiation, a little bit of a slower process to get there. Erections also require blood flow and blood trapping, right? So, um, and the thing is, again, surgery and radiation both affect this, what we call veno-occlusive mechanism. Um, and so that's why oftentimes you'll see um, after radiation therapy, after surgical management, the penis shrinks, both in size, length, and in girth. And that's exactly because of this. It sort of causes a bit of fibrosis. And also the whole mechanism in terms of the penile health is disturbed. In terms of ejaculation, of course, the vast majority of the ejaculate doesn't come from the testicle itself. That's only about 1% of the ejaculate volume. 99% of it comes from the seminal vesicles and prostate. And those are both obviously significantly impacted with any therapy for prostate cancer, whether that's hormonal therapy, surgical management, radiation, right? So again, men will get an ejaculation, which means no ejaculation at all, or decrease ejaculate volume. Um, these are, are very common. And so, so that, if it's important to a patient, and I was out in the, in the Middle East in October, and interestingly, in that culture, ejaculation is by far the most important out of all three of those, like ejaculatory function is very different than North America, but they, they very much want, you know, techniques and procedures that do not inhibit their ejaculation. It's, it's very interesting. And then of course there's hormonal therapy and hormonal therapy really impacts every domain, all four of those domains of sexual function. Um, libido is the first one to be affected. We can get body changes, mood changes, erectile dysfunction, hot flashes, weakness, and then it affects bone health and overall health as well. So again, we don't, as urologists, you know, prescribe hormone therapy willy-nilly, but in some cases, it's very a, a very important adjunct to prostate cancer treatment with radiation, especially. And if it becomes metastatic beyond the prostate, then hormone therapy is the mainstay of treatment. So we talked about how diverse sexual function is, and now the treatment is just as diverse, right? It's not just about, oh, let's put in an implant. It's not just about, here's some Cialis. It's not just about, oh, you know, forget about it. It has multiple domains. So it's, it, it, it affects relationships. It affects psychological health, mental health, obviously the sexual function itself. And it, it certainly does play a role in people's decision-making when they, they have to decide on what treatment they're, they're going at for, for treating their prostate cancer. So because like I said, each one of these could take an hour, I'm gonna focus primarily on the erectile dysfunction part, um, just for sort of simplicity, although be aware that each domain of the sexual function is impacted by prostate cancer treatments. So this is sort of the, the header for the CUA guideline, which is the most up-to-date guideline in erectile dysfunction, actually, uh, in, um, in any of the major uh, organizations in urology in the world. Um, we took a lot of effort um, to have a very diverse panel and looked at evidence, what we call the evidence to decision-making framework when we came up with our recommendation. So it's sort of the highest level of evidence to make a guideline. And it, it did take us three years to do when I, when they asked me to do it, I, I didn't anticipate it would be that much work, but it was a, a great opportunity to meet colleagues from around the country and to learn a new skill set. But some of the stuff we're going to talk about will, will come out of, uh, come out of this uh, guideline. Just about erectile dysfunction in general, because of course we're focusing here on the prostate cancer population. Um, however, erectile dysfunction is general or is, is very prevalent in the general population and obviously much, much more prevalent in the, the prostate cancer treated patient. 
Um, but here, this is sort of a landmark trial. Again, it's old, almost 30 years old now. But what we see is that about 50% of men um, after the age of 40 will have some element of sexual dysfunction. And, and uh, a lot of those are moderate to severe. And we sort of say like uh, as the decades go on, so about 40% of men in their 40s, 50% in their 50s, 60% in their 60s, and so on. So it does become prevalent, although luckily we have great treatments uh, for erectile dysfunction. This was a landmark trial that came out uh, back in 2016. And it's an important one because it sort of talks about the long-term effects of erectile dysfunction based on how a man is treated for their prostate cancer. And so this is using patient reported outcomes, um, which, which are very important, not doctor reported outcomes. Okay. Of course, a doctor or surgeon or a radiation therapist will say, oh yeah, of course my therapy is great and I don't have many complications, right? We can cherry pick our cases. We can only ask those where we know they're doing well. There's a lot of bias in those studies. So these patient reported outcome studies are actually the best ones when we're looking at quality of life data. And what we sort of show here is uh, surgeries in the red. And what you see is there's a quite drastic drop in sexual function right away uh, in surgery. And it's the most profound. However, there is some recovery, you know, and it usually takes 24 to 36 months to sort of see that plateauing. And after that, sort of it, it plateaus and then actually just based on time, it does go down again. Um, and you see, though, even radiation has effect, right? It's not like radiation doesn't have, as we talked about, effect on erections, firmness and on, on, on general dysfunction. And even those that are surveillance just based on time. And based on age and comorbidities, um, they also at five years are becoming, you know, higher rates of erectile dysfunction. So at 72 months after the diagnosis, you know, actually surgery group, radiation group, surveillance group, they're all fairly close when you look at these confidence intervals um, between, uh, you know, in terms of their, their erectile firmness and uh having issues with erectile dysfunction. So just something to keep in mind, the surgery, of course, it's going to be more of a direct effect, very quick, and then some recovery depending on numerous factors. Radiation, though, a slower effect, uh, but over time, at about five years, the rates are quite similar. And this is, again, uh, published data. Brachytherapy, you know, has, you know, it's quoted to sort of have the least effect on erectile function. Uh, least amount. And, and this was a study, again, there's not a lot of great studies on brachytherapy and erectile dysfunction, which is a very interesting. I think that's sort of from the rad onks point of view, they almost don't want to um, let people know. But this was one of the studies, probably the largest in which it's not a huge study at all, but they do have some longitudinal data. And what we see is that brachytherapy also affects erections. You know, it is radiation. It's right by those nerves. Yes, it's supposed to be more targeted. However, there is some effect. And we see that approximately 10 to 15% of men with will develop severe erectile dysfunction with brachytherapy within their first year of treatment. So it's not like um, it doesn't have an effect at all. It does. And these men should, should also be counseled about that, uh, albeit it is less than the other therapies in general. But uh, it, you can't say it doesn't affect erections. This is another study out of European urology focus, basically looking at does the type of surgery we do affect erections differently? And, and this is some of the sort of marketing stuff that you'll see. Of course, in Saskatoon now, we have a robot. That's what the RARP is, the Robot Assisted Radical Prostatectomy. We used to do laparoscopic only, and I know that's a large volume of the prostatectomies done in Regina. And then the open, uh, which uh, is the way that Dr. Chan and I mainly learned how to do it in residency. But what you see here is that, again, they're, they're, they're trying to normalize the data based on volumes and stuff. But you'll see that, the, that the, the amount of rectal dysfunction in each of these groups is very similar. There's no real statistical difference between any of them. And so no matter what type of surgery you have, it's more, more related to the fact that you're having surgery than the way that it was done. And this is a, a great way to sort of understand the natural history of how things work in the average patient. Again, there's going to be nuances. Each person's situation is a bit different, depends a lot on numerous factors. But in general, for the first four months, 
men after prostatectomy do not have nat natural or, or sort of their own erections. To, to be able to obtain an erection, you do need some type of erectile aid. Oftentimes, um, injection therapy or vacuum device, most commonly. Uh, usually the, the oral medications are not that successful, but can be tried. Uh, from the four to 12 months, you do see some early recovery. Again, it depends on numerous factors. Um, about 20% of patients will recover at one year. That's sort of what the literature shows. And by recover, we mean are able to achieve an erection sufficient for intercourse. And then 12 months and beyond out to that sort of 36 months where it plateaus, we, we do see a bit more recovery for sure. The nerves, they're, they're sensitive. They take time to recover. They don't just recover like that. So it's very important to have realistic expectations of what your recovery is going to be like. And, um, and that again, 50% will have some recovery, 50% will not. What affects our recovery? Well, a lot of it has to do with what your preoperative erectile function was. If you have very, very good erectile function before any type of prostate procedure, you have a higher chance of regaining or getting it back. The age of the patient, other health problems that may be impacting erectile function, nerve sparing versus non-nerve sparing, and then the experience of the surgeon or the number of cases that they have is also a factor that's important. There was a lot of vogue, like I remember when um, sort of Cialis, especially when Cialis came out and it was longer acting and, oh, can we, can we pre-treat people and rehab them, uh, giving them these daily doses? And there was a lot of pharma influence in this too, because of course that's a huge population of patients. Um, to potentially see, you know, and, and buy the drug. So does early treatment of erectile dysfunction with pills after surgery improve recovery? And, and there's two, basically two big meta, what we call systematic reviews or meta-analyses that have looked at this. And one is through the Cochrane Review and the other one is through the Journal of Sexual Medicine. And basically both show a very similar effect that no is basically the answer. And that was the same answer uh, that we we put in our um, in our guideline that there's no role for early administration of uh, PD5 inhibitors. That being said, there is a role to have treatment, right? But it's not like having that in addition to anything else um, is going to necessarily get you to the point where you won't need anything in the future. We're not saying you can't try them. It's just that you have to have realistic expectations that they're not necessarily going to speed up your rehab or recovery of the nerves. Okay. And so that's sort of the current evidence here. So it, it's not it's not something that we advocate. Of course, there was some advocacy back in the day, but now we have good studies and, and pretty strong data saying that's not the case. You may have read or, or come across this low intensity shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction. And it's sort of, again, sort of a, a sexy thing. People are looking at it. Is it something, you know, it's not invasive. It sounds like it might be able to cure my erectile dysfunction. And, and you may have seen it uh, advertised on online and other um, modes of advertising. So what shockwaves basically are, of course, we use high intensity shockwaves to break up kidney stones. Low intensity shock waves are such um, that they're often used as a way to regenerate tissues. Okay. And, and this is sort of how, how the hypothesis was that can we regenerate um, nerve tissue, blood vessels uh, through giving shock waves. Um, and really when we look at the literature in a really concerted way, like looking at the studies in which there's not that many, and the ones that are there are actually quite poor quality. And we did a full review of this when we did our erectile uh, dysfunction guideline. There's really only seven randomized control trials that used um, like any type of really decent literature. However, three of those trials have a very, very high risk of bias, which basically means that the, the study findings have to be really questioned. Like they, they, they have protocols in them that that basically bias towards the treatment effect. In other words, favoring the treatment. And so if we, if we look at the trials and take out those three with high risk of bias and just have the four that are remaining that are better quality, we see that the improvement, this IIEF score is basically the way we, we measure erectile function. It's a score from basically five to 35. And, a two, and you need about a four point improvement with a treatment for it to be considered clinically significant or what we call 
the minimally clinically important difference in, in, in score. And so when we look at it just statistically, when we look at those, those four trials, we see the improvement is only two points. And, and really that there, there's a, actually a large placebo effect. But when we look at it like sham effect versus the true treatment, um, the difference is only about two points. And in that case, in our guideline, we said it's not recommended as a treatment at this time. We need more literature. We need to, to, to see what, what strategies, how often it should be used, what type of devices. And it's just not enough literature for us to support it. And it's also not approved by Health Canada for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. So just be very mindful of that. Um, they've looked at it specifically in the post-prostatectomy patient. In this patient population in particular, experts in sexual dysfunction absolutely agree that there's no role in that patient population. Um, so that is something where um, if, if you go see a practitioner and they're saying, oh, consider shockwave, you had your prostate removed or you had prostate radiation, oh, you, you benefit from shockwave. The literature does not support that at all. Um, so again, under the minimally important clinical um, significant difference, either in the short or the long term. There's also some extra things coming out on what we call restorative therapies in addition to the shock wave. And this was a, a statement from the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, which are sort of a think tank for, for sexual dysfunction um, in Canada and, and the United States. And in this case, Restorative therapies, which include things like, you may have heard of P-shot or um, basically uh, plasma therapy uh, injections or stem cells or any of these things, plasma, pl platelet-rich plasma, any of these things, shockwave. Basically, the, the, the bottom line is we need more research. It should be done in a clinical trial only. It's not ready for main, mainstream. And we... We, we don't really have the efficacy to, to recommend it uh, at this time. So again, just trying to inform you um, as, uh, as people who are, are interested in this information, just so you know what the data shows, because anyone can show one little trial that was really highly biased and say, oh, look, it was great. But you have to look at the entire literature in its entirety and what the key members of those who don't have bias, such as myself and others, in this in this line of work uh, and what we sort of are looking at from from a more objective point of view we're not financially gaining from these right a lot of people that are doing this work they're charging thousands and thousands of dollars to patients it's not appropriate in my my viewpoint and of course this is some of the the marketing that's coming out you know trying to get people to to sort of go on and 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 feel like they have to try these therapies and it's 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 sad because really it, it it's it's uh this is a, a patient population that's vulnerable and and it's a patient population who are looking for answers and are trusting of the medical field hoping that yeah if, if, if you're offering it to me obviously it should work um and you know it, it it unfortunately does disappoint me when i when i see such uh such things happening unfortunately so what are the proven things that work for rectal dysfunction? So, of course, we have our, our pills, we have vacuum devices, something called Muse or intraurethral aprostadil. We have injections, which, are, which work great for many people. And then on the top there is a penile prosthesis, which is the most invasive. But I like to see erectile dysfunction treatments sort of taking a therapeutic ladder approach. Um, it's rare for me just to jump right to a penile prosthesis without trying uh, any of these other therapies first, because as you're going to learn, it has its own set of complications. It shouldn't be taken lightly. Okay. But we do tailor the treatment to patient satisfaction and their situation. So we're, we're fortunate in Saskatoon. We have a great team in terms of having some family physicians that have an interest in men's health, nurse navigators and nurses who are really committed to treatment. And then Dr. Chan, uh, myself, we're, we're all committed to offering high level um, care in, in the survivorship. And one of the things we, ca we came up with numerous years ago, but it's a very good resource, is sort of how to, to perform intercapital injection. So we go through a teaching with each of, our, um, each of our patients. We go through the side effects, how to do it. We do a test injection. We give this pamphlet, it's educational pamphlet, and it's worked very, very well. And we've given this to hundreds of patients. In terms of penile prosthesis, it's been quite a, a, a road. Um, 
when I came back after my fellowship, I, I was astonished to hear that penile prosthesis wasn't covered. Um, it was the only province in Canada that didn't cover it. And it took eight years to get it covered and many, many um, documents and, and advocacy to government and media. And uh, this was actually published in 2014. And this was just one of the things that we had published about it. And then five years after that, we finally got, got a code uh, and it's now covered, uh, not for every single indication, but, but um, previous surgery or, or therapies for prostate cancer is one of the, the indications for uh, coverage by, by the government. And, and since it's been covered in 2019, I know you have to take into account COVID was in there. We were doing no prosthetic surgeries during COVID shutdowns or even in the, even now it's less than probably we should be, but uh, we have successfully uh, completed um, 20 implants uh, since the, the new code has come up. And, and I have to say, I've been quite impressed by, by all 20 cases. So what is a penile prosthesis? So basically there's two different types, okay? It's meant to help um, in terms of regaining function but it has limitations. So there's the malleable, which has no reservoir, is the easiest to put in, and has no pump mechanism. Okay, so it's basically a rod that's there. It's somewhat malleable, like you can move it. It has some firmness to it. It's, it's an option. Most men that have one, if they have nothing, they're okay with it. But compared to the inflatable, it, it is an inferior product in most cases. The inflatable, there's a two piece. It has limited role. The three piece though, is what we, we use primarily. And what that has, it's similar in a way to the, um, the inflatable P, um, artificial urinary sphincter with the three components. You have the reservoir, you have the cylinders and you have a scrotal uh, pump. Okay. And basically you activate it by, by pumping. So each, each pump sort of starts filling from the reservoir into the cylinders and the average man, it takes about four to five pumps. Okay. Um, it's not just one pump, uh, like the, um, like the sphincter it's, um, it's multiple and, uh, and to deactivate it, there's a small little valve uh, thing that you press, you hold it for about three seconds that deactivates it and uh, releases uh, the fluid back from the cylinders into the, the reservoir there. So those that are coming in for consideration of a penile prosthesis, uh, we have an initial consultation. We review your candidacy for surgery, make sure you understand the risk benefits of the surgery. Um, there's a bit of a wait list. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably six plus months at least, but uh, we're trying our best to work it down. But uh, there is a wait list, but uh, that, that's the reality of the situation we're in right now. When it comes to surgery, um, we have transitioned to a day surgery procedure, okay? So before we used to admit people overnight, due to bed crunch and being able just to do these, we've converted to day surgery and actually it's worked very well. I'm, I'm very impressed with it. Um, but you do go home, good, good pain coverage. We, we give um, freezing, people usually do very well. They go home um, or stay in a hotel, come back the next day to the clinic, um, what we do is we, there's a catheter that's placed at the time of the procedure. We take that catheter out. There's a very big dressing. We call it a mummy wrap that is removed. And then there can be in some cases, a drain that we put in and that's removed. So usually on day one, all the outside stuff is removed. Very rare for we to, us to leave the drain in an extra day, but sometimes we do. Um, post -op, and then basically go home. You're on antibiotics, oral antibiotics for about 10 to 14 days. And then we bring you back at two weeks and that's when you start cycling the device. And that means pumping it up and then deactivating it, pumping it up, deactivating. And we like people to do that a few times a day and uh, out from two to six weeks. And that's because we want that capsule that's forming, your immune system sort of forming a capsule around these devices, especially the cylinders, for it to be able to stretch. Because if you don't, when it comes time to activate it six weeks later and you haven't cycled it, it's actually very hard to pump it up. And sometimes you can get a bit of a contracture around it and it and you you lose uh, the ability to get really good girth and length and it becomes difficult to pump. So this process is really important to to be to be on board with that. And we tell everyone this as well uh, when they they come in for consideration of the procedure. So it 
it's not just the surgeon's responsibility for a good outcome. It's also the patient's, okay? So the side effects and expectations, if you go for one of these devices, you will not have a natural erection ever again because we actually hollow out or dilate out, um, remove the natural erectile tissue called the, the cavernosa. Uh, so, so that those cavernosa bodies um, are, are destroyed through putting the prosthesis in. So if, if people are like, oh, but I still want a natural erection. No, you can't have that afterwards. The, the second thing is, is that um, there's a three to 5% chance that it could get infected over time. And that's important because if it gets infected, which is the most dreaded complication, it needs to be removed. That's because antibiotics cannot get to bugs on a prosthesis. The bugs will always be there. It can suppress them, but it will not get rid of or eradicate them. So the only way to eradicate it is to get it out or to remove it. And um, sometimes we do that. And unfortunately, it, there's not an ability to put another one in. Um, so this is something else that needs to be understood that, that there's always that chance. There is, it's a device, right? So it has mechanical failure. Luckily, the rate of mechanical failure is quite low, but it, it's estimated about 25 to 30% at 10 years. It depends on the use. The other thing that we tell our patients is the glands or the head of the penis will not get firm or engorged um, when you use this device because it's just in the two big erectile bodies, not in the other third erectile body that we put the device. And that sometimes there can be a little bit of angulation of the head of the penis a little bit um, in some cases. Usually it's not enough to cause any... Um, functional effect. Um, it's very, very, very rare, luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had it, but you know, it's reported uh, very rare to injure the bladder, urethra, or major vessels of the body, but can happen uh, in this procedure. And that people need to be realistic in terms of what they're going to get. We, we sized the, the device at the time. I already told you guys that prostate cancer therapies on their own shrink the penis down. So it's not going to ever be as large as it was prior to your prostate cancer treatment. So the measured lengths is the maximal size we can place. There's the odd person in the States or a couple other places they try to oversize or they, they put like these cuts in and try to make it bigger. That has had huge complications, chronic pain, vascular abnormalities. People have lost their penis from doing that. We do not do that here. I prefer to have a short functional penis than a long non-functional one. So the penis, you know, you have to realize it won't necessarily be as large as maybe you're expecting, but again, it's going to be functional and that's the most important part and we want a safe device. So despite all those negatives and, you know, just being aware of what the risks are, the bottom line is 90% of prostate cancer patients who have this done are very, very happy with the quality of life that it, it gives in terms of their sexual quality of life and would recommend it to another individual. So it, it does have good um, treatment outcomes for sure. So just the take home message, I think this marries very well with what Dr. Chan said too, but that really as urologists, it doesn't stop at um, removing the prostate or giving radiation or hormone therapy, right? There's other effects that this, these cancer treatments have. And in particular on sexual function, it affects all the domains and that the treatment that you're going to receive is has to be individualized based on your own um, factors using that psycho biopsychosocial model of care. And in terms of erectile dysfunction, particularly that's what we mainly focused on, um, be mindful that those restorative treatments that are coming out now that there's some marketing for, and you may be reading about or getting advertised about, or people may mention, they are not a cure. They have not been studied thoroughly and they're very costly. So I don't want people um, wasting their money on things that they're not going to have a good result from. And also, as you know, uh, over the last, uh, well, three plus years now, Saskatchewan now covers penile prosthesis for men with difficult to treat erectile dysfunction. The main implanters in the province are myself, Dr. Chan, and Dr. Garcia and Swift Curran. All right, I think we're right on time. So I'll stop share and we're happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Domes and Dr. Chan. Um, before we go into questions, I want everyone to sit back for a minute and just think. Um, I We have a poll 
that I wanted to ask everyone to do really quickly before we get into the Q&A and the question part. It's in how, uh, uh, how you heard about tonight's meeting. So I'm going to bring that up. I'll launch the, okay. All right. If you don't mind answering that for us. Okay. All right. Has everyone been able to answer that? All right. What, what if we heard about it by uh, another means? No, you know, uh, uh, well, um, you want to share that with us. How does that sound? Yes, I, I got an email from the prostate uh, support group in Montreal. Oh, well, there you go. So it's it's another group affiliate. So yeah, nope, that's perfect. So so you're so you're from Montreal? Yes. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> Welcome. There you go. Okay. We, we so have some great colleagues in Montreal as well. Yeah. I'm gonna end the poll there. I think everyone's answered it. And I'm gonna share the results. Let's see. Rosa, I see we have some work to do there, girl. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, now if you wonder what that's all about, Rosa is from the Jack FM 94.5, and she's helping us uh, with our, our social media and... Uh, and trying to get get more awareness out there. So she has been so kind to help us with us. So we'll have to talk later, Rosa, about this all. Mm -hmm. So um, if anyone has any questions, there's a couple of ways on how we can do this. 